Okay, so thank you for all coming to my talk and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, my talk will be sort of following on from John's and from Orses and from Hisham's and a prelude to Domenico's, but it will have maybe a little bit more mathematics than some people are comfortable with and perhaps not as much mathematics as other people would like. So to begin with, I'm going to start with a motivation. I'm talking about parameterized homotopy theory and gauge enhancement in M theory. The key open problem in M theory is the phenomenon of gauge enhancement, which is supposed to make M brains exhibit the non-abelian degrees of freedom that we see perturbatively in the limit of 10G string theory. At the heart of this issue is double dimensional reduction. So in ordinary colloids like line reduction, compactifying on a circle fiber, Reduces the field theory in one dimension lower, with a larger space of fields corresponding to the Fourier modes of that circle fiber that we compactify on. In the context of black brains and supergravity, we may ask if the singular locus of a black P brain extends along that circle fiber or not. If it does not, then we get a black P brain in the lower dimensional supergravity theory, but if it does, then we get a black P minus 1 brain in the lower dimensional supergravity theory. So the dimensions have been reduced twice. So here this is schematically written. We have no wrapping and then we have wrapping. <clears throat> so in M theory, in full M theory, this double dimensional reduction mechanism is supposed to exhibit a duality between the full non-perturbative theory of D brains, whatever that is, and their M brain lifts. Okay, but in the perturbative, in the perturbative world down in 10 dimensions. Uh, the phenomenon of gauge enhancement on coincident D brains is extremely important <coughs> in terms of realizing string theory and therefore M theory as a realistic model of physics. So, in perturbative 10D string theory, a string ending on a D brain acts as a quantum for a, a acts as a charge for a U1 gauge field on that D brain world volume. If we have N coincident D brains, an informal but widely accepted argument of Witten says that this u1 to the n that we get from each of the nd brains enhances to un. So if m theory is to have a well-defined mathematical existence, then this phenomenon ought to be a consequence of or correspond to some phenomenon on m brains. So we have something on d brains. We want to understand what happens on the m brain lifts. But it's been accepted for some time, however, that the gauge fields carried by the two a brains unify to a to define a class in twisted K theory. And it's only this twisted K theory class that has a real invariant meaning. So we have to take them all at once, all of the D brains and the twisted K theory class. So this highlights the question of how the full list of D brain species, together with their twisted K theory class, arise from M theory under double dimensional reduction. So this is now a question about fundamental D brains, so those admitting a Green Schwartz sigma model description. And only the M2 and the M5 exists in, M, in an M theory as, <clears throat> as fundamental brains. And double dimensional reduction of the M2 and the M5 hit all of the D brains, all of the brains in type 2A, except the D6 and the D8. So a more refined version of the gauge enhancement question is how does M theory produce the fundamental D brain species and the unified K theory charges? So the partial answer to this question, which I'm going to discuss, and Hisham has already given a spoiler alert for, is through the M brain charge coefficients. So I should remark here that the D0 it doesn't seem to be coming from the M2 or the M5. It's actually a reflection of the circle fiber that we compactify them on. Right, so as I said, we are getting, we, we will end up seeing all of the D brains together with their twisted K theory charge in <coughs> rational homotopy theory via the charge structure on the M brains. So I'm going to recall a little bit, yes. Just a comment, if you are, if you are okay with the fact that D0 is a uh, is 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 charge with respect to the second is like a gauge field, then it's automatic that the D6 is, uh, is it's like that not Please uh, climb on the top. I mean, you missed from that previous thing when you have them, you should have a wave up there. Right, so this is... And then you should have a Kluge Klein monopole as well. And then that would be the D6. He did on previous slide. Yeah, so this is, this is in the, the black brain picture that yeah, we have yeah. here. Uh, yeah. yeah, so whereas, whereas here we're trying to see where the fundamental brains come from. Why is it only two more fundamental than a wave? Uh, because it admits a Green-Schwartz sigma model description. 
It's a digital degree of freedom. You have to add in above gravity. Right, so, so I'm just going to recall the charge quantization condition because this idea of charges living in cohomology theories is central to what I'm going to say here, what we're going to say next. So according, according to Dirac's charge quantization argument, charges live in twisted or untwisted differential cohomology. So as we saw in Hisham's talk, differential cohomology, which is this E hat over here, encodes differential form data, which is flux forms, curvature forms, together with a refinement of the Durand cohomology class to a lattice inside real cohomology. So that lattice inside real cohomology is controlled by an auxiliary cohomology theory that maps to real cohomology. So we have a cohomology theory here that's telling us about our charge quanta. And the fact that the, the fact that the Durand classes of these field strengths of these flux forms inside real cohomology live in the image of this lattice is the charge quantization condition. So really what we're, out, what we're asking for is trying to determine what this E is for m -rates. So d brain charges live in twisted differential k-theory. What controls m brain charge? We saw in Hisham's talk his, uh, his proposal, which is that m brain charge is controlled by degree 4 cohomotopy, that is by mapping into the force speed. So this proposed cohomotopy charge structure of m brains Firstly, it, it reproduces the equations of motions for the supergravity G4 and its hodge dual G7 flux form. But secondly, and much more interestingly, and I, I think unfortunately we won't, we won't have a chance to, to see this during, during this meeting, um, if we can, so if we sort of heuristically identify this S4 with the force sphere around a black M5 brain in 11D supergravity, then we can imagine that this S4 uh, has induced a real structure together with ADE actions. So in, in recent work, John Werther, Hisham Sati, and Or Schreiber have shown that if we enhance this degree four cohomotopy to include these, this real structure and the ADE actions, then we get black brains appearing just from this degree four, this degree four cohomotopy charge. So we're not just getting the equations of motions out of this, out of this, uh, this really great guess, but we're also getting black brains. What I'm going to talk about today is how rationally, after double dimensional reduction, this degree four cohomotopy charge also produces the twisted K theory charge of the fundamental D brain. So in particular, we get all of the D brain co-cycles together with their, well, the rational image of their twisted K theory charge. But first I need to step back a little bit and set up some, some nice mathematical tools that I'm going to use to talk about cohomology. Generalized cohomology theories are presented by spectra, which are the objects of study in stable homotopy theory. We saw in all this talk that homotopy theory is like engaged mathematics. Instead of taking things to be equal, we want to ask if they're equivalent to one another, and if we have equivalences between those equivalences, and so on and so forth. So homotopy theory is gauged mathematics. Stable homotopy theory is gauged linear mathematics. So it's homotopy, we have gauge transformations, but it's also linear. So what do I mean by linear? Well, by linear I actually mean abelian. So we're looking for homotopy theory that is somehow abelian. How do we make sense of this? Well, the prototypical homotopical group is the loop space of the space. So here x doesn't have to be a group. I'm not talking about loop groups. I'm talking about loop spaces. If I look, if I fix a base point in a space x and look at loops at that point, then I can concatenate loops. This concatenation operation up to homotopy makes this omega x into a, a homotopical group. And this is the prototypical example of homotopical groups. They're all of this form. Well, I can look at double loop spaces. This is a homotopical group of homotopical groups. I now have two loop directions to compose. And the ekman hilton argument tells me that these two loop directions are compatible with one another in a very strong way. It gives me a sort of first order homotopic commutativity. So I can continue, I can take iterated loop spaces. And each time I, I loop, so I go from omega n, the nth loop space of x, or the loop space of the loop space n times of x, and then I loop that, I'm getting ever more commutative. So the idea here is that abelian homotopical groups are infinite loop spaces. They are spaces that are infinite loop spaces of some other space. 
Right, so homotopical abelian groups are infinite loop spaces. How do we actually make sense of this? We make sense of this using spectra. <coughs> spectra are mathematical objects that formally encode this idea of infinite loop spaces. More precisely, I didn't want to write a definition here because I didn't want to go too far into the mathematics, but you can, you can see that it's there. So a spectrum is a sequence of pointed topological spaces, so I need the base point so I know where to take the loops, P0, P1, P2, etc., equipped with homotopy equivalences from the nth space to the loop space of the space above it. So what this is saying is that a spectrum might have a sequence of spaces and each of the levels, each of these pn's, they are infinite loop spaces. So pn is the loop space of pn plus 1, which is the double loop space of pn plus 2, and so on. It's the kth loop space of pn plus k. I can just keep on going. So a spectrum is a collection of spaces that are all infinite loop spaces, and the way in which they are infinite loop spaces is part of the defining data. The spectra organized into a homotopy theory. We saw in Horst's talk that Spaces organize into a homotopy theory of spaces, which is the, the homotopy category. Here, spectra organize into a homotopy theory, which is the stable homotopy category. I'm going to denote by Ho spectra. So there is a, an adjunction, roughly a duality, between the homotopy theory, the homotopy theory of spaces that was talked about, and the homotopy theory of spectra. I can go from spaces to spectra via this assignment, via this functor, sigma infinity x plus which is called the suspension spectrum functor. The idea here is that I'm taking a space, viewed it as a homotopical set, and this functor takes the free homotopical abelian group on that homotopical set. Right, so I can take free homotopical abelian groups this way, and go the other way, I can take a homotopical abelian group and forget that it's a homotopical abelian group. I just forget the group structure. And saying that I have an adjunction here is basically just saying that if I take a space x, and look at the free, the free homotopical abelian group on that space X and map into a spectra, that's the same, map into a spectrum, that's the same as specifying a map of spaces from X into the spectrum after I've forgotten that it, after I've forgotten it's infinite loop space structure. So you can sort of think of this adjunction, this duality, as the gauge version of a sort of more concrete and down-to-earth adjunction between sets and abelian groups. So given any set, I can take the free abelian group on that set, and conversely, given any abelian group, I can just forget that it's an abelian group and look at the underlying set. And that I have an adjunction here is saying that if I take a set X, take the free abelian group on that set, and then specify a map of abelian groups from, from that free abelian group into A, well, that's just the same as specifying a map of sets from the underlying set X to the underlying set of A. So this is the concrete version of this, or this up the top is really this here plus homotopy plus gauge. Okay, so why have I been talking about spectra this whole time? That's because spectra determine generalized cohomology theories. So given a spectrum curly E, I can define a generalized cohomology theory based on this spectrum by saying, well, so every space X, I'm going to take the free abelian group on that space X, look at maps from that into E. This space of maps naturally forms a space, and then I can take its homotopy group. And taking those homotopy groups gives me this assignment of abelian groups. This thing here is a generalized cohomology theory. So every spectrum gives me a generalized cohomology theory. And the fundamental result in algebraic topology is that every cohomology theory arises from a spectrum. So spectra give cohomology theories, and cohomology theories give spectra. All right, but I've already said twisted K-theory a few times. All right, so we, know, we want to know how twists enter the game. This is just so far only talking about cohomology theories. What about twisted cohomology theories? Well, twisted cohomology theories are represented by parameterized spectra, by families of spectra, by families of cohomology theories. <coughs> so here I've got a nice table of analogies. So we have a, a nonlinear world. So in, in ordinary differential geometry, the nonlinear objects that we're interested in are manifolds. In homotopy theory, they're spaces. The linear version are vector spaces in geometry and spectra in homotopy theory. What we're interested in to try to understand twisted cohomology are, is the parameterized linear context. So in differential geometry, the parameterized linear context, we're talking about a family of vector spaces that are parameterized by something nonlinear. Well, that's precisely a vector bundle. So in homotopy theory, the parameterized linear thing is just a parameterized spectrum. We have a family of spectra that depend on a base space. 
So I'm not going to go into the, the nitty gritty details of how one actually defines this because it, it's, a little, it's a little bit subtle, but I'll give you a bit of an idea of how this works. So given the space X, this is my base space, I'm going to look at retractive spaces over X. This is just a space Y that subjects to X and such that X sits inside Y. So this subjection has a section. What we can do is we can, over any point of X, look at the fiber of P over X, and this gives us a base, this gives us a topological space with a choice of base point. So such a retractive space <coughs> is a family of pointed spaces parameterized by X. Okay, so this is the parameterized version of what we started with before when we were trying to understand spectra, trying to understand homotopical abelian groups. So luckily, there is an operation sending a retractive space to its fiber-wise loop space. What it does is, well, what it does is it outputs a space, omega sub x, y, and the idea is that the fiber of this thing, this now is a retractive space over x, the fiber of this thing at x is the loop space of the fiber. So I'm just taking, I'm just looping each fiber individually, but in a coherent way. So this operation sends parameterized family of pointed spaces to a parameterized family of homotopical groups. And these are the prototypes for parameterized homotopical groups over X. Now, as we did before, we can just increase the loop order. We can look at things that are increasingly fiber-wise, increasingly abelian fiber-wise homotopical groups. Right? So we can just iterate this, this omega n sub X and end up with things parameterized over x, space of parameterized over x, whose fibers look like ever more increasing, ever more increasingly abelian homotopical groups. And the idea is that x parameterized spectra are mathematical objects that encode in a precise way, very similar to what we saw previously, these fiber-wise infinite loop spaces over x. The corresponding x parameterized stable homotopy category, which, which encodes the, the homotopy theory of such things, um, together with a parameterized version of this stabilization injunction that I showed you a few slides before. We can pass from a parameter, so we can, we saw a few slides before that we can pass from the unstable to the stable world and back, and this was like taking free abelian groups and forgetting abelian group structure. There's also a parameterized version of this that essentially does this operation over each fiber. All right, so let's try to sit down and digest what these things are supposed to be. If I have a connected base space, then it's just a mathematical fact that all of the fibers of a parameterized spectrum are equivalent. So if I take two points in X, then the fiber spectra are equivalent. What that means is that I can view a parameterized spectrum, so a parameterized family of infinite loop spaces, as specifying a homotopical action of the loop space of X on the fiber over a distinguished point. I can just pick a distinguished point in my space X and look at the fiber over that point, which I'm going to call x pull back p, so I'm just pulling back the fiber of the point, and then specifying this data of a parameterized, this datum of a parameterized spectrum is the same as saying, well, I have this single spectrum that's acted on by x, or by the loop space of x. Right, so parameterized spectra are the same thing as actions of the loop space of x on a fixed spectrum. So the reason that I wanted to say this is so that what I'm about to say makes a little bit more sense. So if I take an arbitrary parameterized spectrum, which I can view as a single spectrum acted on by x, and a map tau from a space m to x, then I can now define the tau twisted e cohomology of that space m. So here in this diagram, I have the co-cycle tau, so mapping from m to x. I have this parameterized spectrum sitting over x, which is encoding a way of twisting e by x. And the tau twisted e cohomology of m is just looking at sections of this bundle of spectra. Right? Another way of doing this would be to say, let's take this and pull it back to a bundle over m, and then I can look at sections there. For trivial twists, so this is a nice consistency check. For trivial twist, twist I need the case that tau here is not homotopic. This is just ordinary cohomology. So the idea is that twisted cohomology, twisted cohomology is really like taking sections of vector bundles but in a homotopical sense. So here's a, an example of a twisted cohomology theory or a parameterized spectrum that we all care about, uh, twisted K theories. The complex K theory is classified by a spectrum KU. It corresponds to an infinite loop space, a spectrum. Um, tensoring with complex lines equips this spectrum with an action of the space VU1. 
which gives rise to a parameterized spectrum of this form. So, yeah, the parameterized spectrum encoding the action of BU1 on KU over this space B2U1. Now, this space B2U1 is the classifying space for U1 germs. So, this object, this parameterized spectrum, is the moduli object for K theory twisted by germs. So, in principle, if I want to know anything about K theory classes that are twisted by germs, then this is what I should be using. This is somehow in the background controlling the whole picture. What did the BU1 action do? Yeah, right. So this this is something that, that you can, if you're a homotopy theorist, write down and wave your hands. But essentially, what essentially what this is encoding is it's encoding the fact that you can take a vector bundle and tensor by by a line bundle. There is a spatial realization of this, which is exactly what I mean by the BU1 action on KU. You can sort of write down at the level of spaces, so at the level of spectra, an action on each of the level, an action of BU1 on each of the levels of a given presentation of this. And so these twisted homology uh, theories are automatically equivalent in some sense with respect to these twisted actions? Yeah, so, so it's it's there's, a little bit of, there's a little bit of a subtlety. There are, in homotopy theory, there are two types of equivariant homotopy theory. So here it's equivariant, so I'll go back a little bit. Uh, here it's equivariant in the sense that I'm working equivariantly with respect to the loop group, but this corresponds to what is known in homotopy theory as naive equivariant homotopy theory. There's sort of a more proper version, which is what I alluded to before in the work of, of uh, John Willis and Hisham. So yes, it's, it's equivariant, but but in a way that algebraic topologists would find unsatisfactory. Sorry? Or boring. Or, or boring, yeah. I mean, they call it the naive equivariant theory. Okay, so homotopy theory is, is very rich, and the reason for that is that a map of spaces represents an isomorphism in the homotopy category if and only if it induces an isomorphism on all homotopy groups for all choices of base point. But homotopy groups are extremely difficult to compute. There are various techniques for computing them, but they're, they're very long and involved and difficult to use. So it can be very hard to tell if something is an isomorphism in the homotopy and yet this is true just for CW complexes, so... Yeah, yes, yeah, so, so, so... For example, what you said is just not true for all, for this week, it, it, what you wrote is weak point of equivalence. So yeah, right, so yeah. the modern way of, of working with the, the homotopy category is to just say that we take topological spaces and localize the weak homotopy equivalences. Because in any case, we want to replace, we want to apply the CW approximation theorem. So it's not whole space. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's debatable. I think, uh, in principle, I should be and then, then more careful about... And then it's by definition. Pardon? But then it is by definition. Yes, yeah, yeah. But this is... So then it is not a statement. A statement for CW complexes. Yes, yes. But, right, so the way that the, way that, that the homotopy category of spaces is treated nowadays is usually by saying let's invert at the weak homotopy equivalences. It's not the full homotopy category that you mean, but it's the thing that is used. Because in any way, almost everything is done with CW. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not arguing about that, but I'm saying that this is not a statement, it's just definition then, of equivalence. Yes, yeah. that's one way of viewing it. Yeah. But in any case, so determining when something is an isomorphism is, in this homotopy category is difficult because homotopy groups are difficult to compute. So we have a similar story in the stable homotopy category. Spectra have their own homotopy groups that stable homotopy groups, and the map of spectra is an isomorphism in this stable homotopy category if and only if it induces an isomorphism <laughs> in these stable homotopy groups, and that's just saying that the cohomology theories represented by E and by F are isomorphic, are naturally isomorphic. Parameterized homotopy theory, parameterized stable homotopy theory is a combination of both. So we have the richness up here and the slightly less richness down here. So a map of parameterized spectra over X induces an isomorphism in the homotopy category of things parameterized over X, if and only if this thing restricts to an isomorphism on each fibers, that's the second line. And that's the same as saying that E and F, these fibers E and F, are isomorphic, so that's stable information, as modules over this omega X, so that's unstable information, combining stable and unstable information. Right. So I was just talking about why uh, I was just talking about why this story is so rich, and it's because homotopy groups are difficult to compute. 
But a large part of what makes homotopy theory difficult are the torsion subgroups of these homotopy groups. So the homotopy groups are abelian groups. They split as a free part and a torsion part. And it turns out that if we ignore the torsion part, the story becomes much simpler. That's the whole idea of rational homotopy theory. And in fact, the story becomes so much simpler that it becomes algebraic. This is a story from the 60s and 70s, Judy Quillen and Sullivan. Um, in the unstable situation, the, the Sullivan picture says that if we look at spaces, if we look at the homotopy theory of spaces, rationally, so that means we're disregarding torsion, and with some finiteness and regularity conditions, then this is completely encoded by algebraic objects. It's completely encoded by differential graded commutative algebras. So here, I go from spaces to algebras. What I'm doing is essentially taking a space to an algebra that commute, computes its cohomology. Now, since cohomology is contravariant, it reverses arrows I have an op here. And going in the other way around, if I have an algebra that I think of as computing the cohomology of the space, I can extract from it a space. Now, this is what's happening in the unstable picture. In the stable picture, I have a similar adjunction, a similar duality that sends a spectrum just to a, a rational cochain complex. And again, its rational cochain complex is just computing its rational cohomology. Right, so if I throw away torsion, I can identify homotopy theory with completely algebraic things. And the existence of minimal models in this picture allows us to read off the rational cohomology as well as rational homotopy groups from algebraic data. So it's a very powerful approximation. It's a very powerful approximation to homotopy theory. As soon as we discard the torsion, we can just work entirely in the realm of algebra. <coughs> so this the G algebra there, the cochain algebra. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, the, I mean, the prototypical example of such a thing would be the, the chevalier allenberg algebra of a, of a Lie algebra. Although these chevalier allenberg DG algebras only give you well-defined, well, only give you nice objects in rational homotopy theory, the Lie algebra that you start with is nil. Okay, so on the previous slide I was saying that unstable rational homotopy theory is controlled by DG algebras. The stable theory is controlled by cochain complexes. So if I've got a parameterized spectrum, I can think of this thing as a single spectrum twisted by or acted upon by x. If x is sufficiently nice, then its rational homotopy type is just algebraic. And the fiber, the spectrum E, this is also algebraic. So I have a cochain, uh, I have a DG algebra corresponding to x and a cochain complex corresponding to the fiber, which so this picture suggests that this parameterized spectrum should be encoded rationally by a rational avatar of X acting upon a rational avatar of the fiber. And that is indeed the case. This is a, a theorem that I, that I proved in my thesis, which is that if I have an algebraic model for the rational homotopy type of the space X, so I want this to be minimal, but it's okay. Um, if this space X is simply connected, then there's a, an equivalence of categories between spectra over x with some finiteness condition and dg modules over the corresponding algebraic model. This is saying that parameterized spectra are dg modules. What is BVL? Sorry? What is BVL? So BVL is bounded below. Yeah. Right, so the argument works by taking a fixed stage and then working up Bosnikov tower. So you have to start somewhere and then continue. You can't go into an infinitely negative degree. Right, so this is summarized in this table here, whereas stable homotopy theory rationally is cochain complexes, and unstable homotopy theory rationally is DG algebras. The parameterized stable version, which is like extending unstable by stable, is parameterized spectra. Rationally, this is just DG modules. So I have something here acted on by something here. And a nice consequence of this story is that many, nat many natural constructions in homotopy theory have nice algebraic descriptions. For example, the stabilization that I was telling you about before forgets algebraic structure in the rational models. The destabilization sends DG modules to free algebras. Pullbacks of parameterized spectra are push forwards of DG modules. So all of these constructions have nice descriptions in the algebraic world. So an example that we that is important to us is if we take K theory, we look now at connected K theory. So K theory is a two-periodic cohomology theory, and we we kill everything in, dimension, in negative dimensions. If we look at rational twisted connective K theory, then a minimal model for this is as written on the slide. So here I have 
these modular generators corresponding to the to the rational germ classes. Here, this is a DG algebra with one generator in degree three corresponding to B two U one, and this part acts on these modular generators. So here I have the algebraic part, here I have the modular part, and this is the differential. So this is just the twisted Duran complex. Um, actually, what we'll need is a two-shifted version of this. So instead of starting the generator, the K-theory generator at degree zero, we want to start it in degree two. Okay. So I've talked for a long time about parameterized homotopy theory and what it looks like rationally. So let's now go back to M-theory. So working now in the, the rational approximation, which we heard about it a little bit in, in John's talk and in Hisham's on Monday, we have access to algebraic models of stable, unstable, parameterized homotopy types. All right, so this is helping, what we're trying to do now is work out what the charge coefficients are by seeing what we can do with their rational images, by doing some consistency checks on their rational images. Co-cycles in generalized cohomology, right, these are supposed to be dictating our charge, these are controlled after rationalization or realization by their flux forms. And these flux forms satisfy twisted Bianchi identities or equations of motion, which allow us to identify them as co-cycles in generalized cohomology. Right, so we saw in the Hitchhunter's talk on Monday that the uh, twisted Bianchi identities for the G4 and the G7 forms in 11-dimensional supergravity identify them as a co-cycle in degree 4 cohomotopy. And the Ramon Ramon fields in type 2A, well, this is, this is the rational version of twisted shifted even K theory. So the shift here is coming from the fact that the, I, I start at F2 instead of, I start with a degree 2 thing, the twist, instead of starting with degree 0. Right. Uh, sorry, a very stupid question. <coughs> um, so on this M theory side, you have differential forms, so you have smooth geometry. But on the other side, you have homotopy types and not smooth homotopy types. So isn't it kind of strange that you take topological homotopy theory and not smooth homotopy theory to address this point? Right, so, so really what we should be doing is doing things in the full uh, differential cohomology. But what we need to do in order to, in order to work in the full differential cohomology, we first need to identify what the, the non-form part of that is. Okay, so you look at the underlying so we look, yeah, so we look at the underlying cohomology theory, and then the idea is that once we know beyond the rational approximation what that underlying cohomology theory is, then we can do the, the full thing in, in differential cohomology. We do have some of the ingredients. We do have what differential cohomotopy is. I mentioned it briefly. Okay. Right. Um, so, so far, I haven't said anything about supersymmetry. To properly take local supersymmetry into account, we need to refine these flux forms to superflux forms. And then the supergravity torsion constraints require the bifermionic components of the superflux forms to be covariantly constant on each supertangent space, where they identify with cocycles, with, with super Lie algebra cocycles. Or taking the dual approach, as we saw in John's talk, these give us maps between super differential graded, super differential graded commutative algebras. Right, so we land in super rational homotopy theory. So an example for this is the combined M2 M5 cocycle. This is going from the super the 11 dimensional super translation, uh, the 11 dimensional super Minkowski space to the four sphere. In terms of the rational homotopy theory, what we do is we take minimal models for the corresponding spaces, and then a map this cocycle going from super Minkowski space time to S4 is given algebraically by map going the other way. So here is a minimal model for S4. I have a degree four generator and a degree seven generator satisfying these conditions. And the super translation, the algebra encoding super Minkowski space time is given by this. I have bosonic, uh, bosonic generators in degree one going from zero to 10 corresponding to my, <laughs> my, uh, my field line fields. And here I have uh, the spin, sorry, here I have my odds degree one coordinates corresponding to the, the super part, to the, to the super currents, and this is the differential. And then the combined M2, M5 cocycle, so going this way on, on spaces, but going the other way on algebras, sends this omega four to this spin invariant super cocycle, and this omega seven to this spin invariant super cocycle. And in order for this map to be a map of DG algebras, I want that 
I want that this map to reach the differential, so I want to have these conditions to be satisfied by these co-cycles, and this is indeed the case. So the idea here is that this co-cycle is encoding the M2, and this co-cycle is encoding the M5. Okay, so we now have a description of the combined M2, M5 charge in super-rational homotopy theory. So I was saying before, well, so now we want to understand how D-brain, how the, the twisted K-theory charges of D-brains are seen under double-dimensional reduction. So we need to know what this is algebraically. And the idea, due to, to Domenico, Hisham, and Woods, is that double-dimensional reduction is encoded by this, by, uh, by duality. What it does is it sends a, a space that lives over the classifying space of the circle. We can take extensions to get a, a space over here, or going the other way, I can take a space, map the circle into it. This now has a circle action that I can then quotient out by. So I have this duality between um, uh, Abstrality between spaces with, with maps to BS1 and spaces. So this is at the level of homotopy theory, and it admits an algebraic description in super-rational homotopy theory. So roughly, this X going from spaces over BS1 to spaces sends this algebraic information, this is encoding a two-co-cycle, to the central extension encoded by that two-co-cycle. So this X here, rationally, is just central extensions by two-co-cycles. The other way around is sick. It's a little bit more complicated, but essentially what it does is it takes a, a minimal model, so an algebraic description of your rational homotopy type, and adds certain extra generators. So for each generator of the original algebra that you have, you keep that, but you add an extra generator with degree shifted down by one, and then a generator in degree two that corresponds to the circle vibration. And this adding of generators in degree down by one and keeping the original generators this is where the double dimensional reduction mechanism is seen in the rational picture. Um, so an example of, of where this is used, we saw this extensively in John's talk, this X taking extensions, well this was supposed to be brain condensation. So for example, the, on type 2A superspace time, there is a D0 brain 2 co-cycle, Right, which identifies it rationally with an object in here, we can take x of this, and the result of taking x of this is precisely the 11-dimensional super Minkowski space time. And this taking x is a rational homotopy version of the D0 brain condensation. This is, yeah, this is the top of the, this is part of the top of the brain bouquet that we saw in John's talk. Okay, so we can use this adjunction now to build a diagram in super rational homotopy theory. So I have X of the D0 brain co cycle, this is 11 dimensional super space time. It has this combined M2, M5 co cycle to the four sphere, and then I can apply SIC to it, the cyclic loop space construction. But since, on my previous slide, since this is an adjunction, there is a way of relating type 2A space time to SIC of X of type 2A space time. So this is for the, the units. So I can compose this unit map with the simplified N2 brain co cycle and get a map from type 2A, uh, super space time, to SIC of S4. Alright, so now let's have a look at what the minimal model of SIC of S4 is. Well, S4 started out with a generator in degree 4, a generator in degree 7. Taking SIC adds a generator in degree 3, which is the shifted version of the degree 4 guy, generator in degree 6, which is the shifted version of the, de of the degree 7 guy, and a generator in degree two. There's a prescribed way of generating the differentials on these guys, and we get this. And it turns out that this combined, that this combined co-cycle after cyclifying, and so uh, under this rational double-dimensional reduction, this mu m2 m5 wise tilde co-cycle, well, each of these terms picks up a superly algebra co-cycle that we know. So it sends omega 2 to the d0, h3 to the f1, omega 4 to the d2, omega 6 to the d4, and h7 to the ns5 co-cycles respectively. So we see all of the super co-cycles that we get in type 2a, except for the, uh, the, except for the d6 and the d8. So what about the d6 and the d8? Okay, so let's set the scene a little bit. 
I mentioned before this equivariant enhancement of this of this uh, rational co-cycle at ADE subgroups, which makes the black brains appear. Now the A series actions factor through a, an S1 action, which on space-time we can identify with the n-theory circle fiber. And on the on the S4 coefficients, we have a, an S1 action. So we can pass to the homotopy quotient on the S4 coefficients, we can pass to the homotopy quotient on the 11-dimensional space-time, uh, on the 11-dimensional super space-time, this is collapsing the n-theory circle fiber. So we might ask, can we complete this diagram? Does this co-cycle descend? And the answer is, well, does this co-cycle descend? Equivalently, in terms of the diagram that I had before, I can write it as follows. And the, answer, and the question is, can we now factor through, can this double-dimensionally reduced co-cycle factor through here? And the answer is no, because this factorization would require the D4 co-cycle to vanish, which it doesn't. And it also violates the equations of motion of the deeply flux form. But the fact that this double-dimensionally reduced co-cycle produces the D0, D2, and D4 is due to a truncated copy of rational shifted twisted K theory living inside here. So we already see little bits of K theory at the rational level. How do we untruncate though? How do we get the D6 and the D8? To do this, we need to make some room. And this is where the whole story of parameterized stable homotopy theory comes in. So, so far we've just been working with rational homotopy types. These are stable things. If we have any hope of getting something in twisted K theory, so that's a parameterized, that's a parameterized stable thing, parameterized over an unstable thing, where do the stable directions come from? Right, so we, we, have, this, we have this diagram that I had before. So, Double-dimensionally reduced co-cycle that misses out the D6, uh, the, the D6 and the D8. I'm completing the diagram here to write the fundamental string co-cycles and map to B2R. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fiberwise stabilize. So I take SIG S4, which I view as a space living over B2R. I take the fiberwise stabilization, that's the sigma infinity part. So I take the fiberwise infinite loop space, and then forget fiberwise infinite loop space structure. And now I can do the same thing to the to the homotopy quotient S4 mod S1. This maps to SIG S4. Applying this stabilization machinery, I still get a map from here to here. And I can and it just turns out if you if you look at the rational models that there is a copy of shifted Connected K theory living inside here. Right? This is the full, this is the full untruncated guy. So we can ask now, does this factor through here? Does this guy factor through here, thereby giving us the extra cocycles that we're missing? And the answer is yes, it does. So this this cocycle here is of this form, which encodes the uh, encodes the fundamental string cocycle as well as all of the D brain cocycles. So it exhibits enhancement of this co-cycle, which was missing out the D6 and the D8, by precisely those missing co-cycles. So interestingly, the, the NS5 disappears. So the NS5 lives here, um, it disappears after we stabilize. So one thing that I want to emphasize is that this passage to, five, uh, this passage to parameterized stable homotopy theory is the first stage in, in what is known as homotopical perturbation theory. And it's the first stage of what is called the, the Goodwillie calculus. The Goodwillie calculus is a, way of uh, is a way of approximating homotopy types. So the idea is that if you want to look at a function, a smooth function, you can try to approximate it by looking at its value at a point, and then its derivative at a point, and then its second derivative, and so on. The Goodwillie calculus, or homotopy perturbation theory, is basically the same idea, but for functors between homotopical contexts. So here, if I map into this, if I view mapping into this as my homotopical functor, then its first derivative, its first approximation, this good really perturbation theory, is exactly this. So what's interesting is that we don't see the D6 and the D8 cocycles appearing here, but only after we pass to the first derivative, to the first approximation, as it were. So in summary, the perturbative gate enhancement of the double-dimensional reduction of combined S4 M2 and M5 co-cycle is exhibited by lifting through the fiberwise stabilization of the type A for the space of the full sphere. So this gives us some 
outstanding question. So all of this is done at the rational level. Right? I, this is a, was a subject of, of uh, some conversation on Monday after Hisham's talk. This is all done at the rational level. We would really like to be seeing full non-rational homotopy theory here. Well, part of, the, part of the problem here is that, well, rational homotopy theory we know is the rational version of homotopy theory. Everything that I've been saying has been, has been living in super-rational homotopy theory. But what's the unrational version of super-rational homotopy theory? I don't know. Another question is, well, I was trying to belabor this point that we only got the D6 and the D8 co-cycles after we passed to the 5 y stabilization. Right? So this is applying this good Willy calculus of functors. What is the role of homotopical perturbation theory here in M theory and in string theory? I would, I think that this is a, a fascinating question. Is it just a coincidence that we need to 5 y stabilize in this particular case? Or is this indicative of some deeper role that is to be played? And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. take twisted K theory and then you rationalize, you get the twisted Durand cohomology. But if you take K theory and rationalize, you get cohomology, and then twisting that is not the same. diagram at the end, I'm saying S4 here and I'm saying shifted twisted K theory here, but really there are many things that rationally could look like S4 or rationally could look like shifted twisted K theory. The point is that, that working on this assumption of rationally it's the force sphere, we generate all of this structure. So the real question, as I was saying at the end, is what is the non-rational lift of this? Many things could rationally look like a force look like a force sphere and look like this twisted K theory. Yeah. But the, the point is that we now understand the, the mechanism rationally. Right, I guess my question is how do you need to do it rationally at the rational level? This, this lift, you mean? Yes. Um, right, so, so supposing that you, well, there could be in principle many things that live, that live inside here that factor through. But using this, this sort of physical motivation of quotienting down by the, the type A orbit space, this singles out this homotopy quotient and its unit map. Yeah. Right? And the point is that once you have this physical input, then the lift is unique. Okay, cool. Uh, I would suggest, since 
the next item as interesting not as slash it's discussion slash coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> we continue the discussion of coffee break. Thank you very much.